Hello, my name is Jane Robinson. I'm a local author. I specialise in social history through women's eyes. And I'm going to talk to you today about the first women in the traditional professions. It's based on my most recent book, which is called Ladies Can't Climb Ladders. Picture, if you will, an early spring evening in London exactly a century ago. It's unseasonably cold. There's already a promise of frost in the air as small groups of women begin to arrive through the gas-lit dusk at the Palace of Westminster. Three or four stride confidently, neat and slim in loose-fitting coats with hems well above the ankle and close-brimmed hats. The rest walk more slowly. Their costumes are structured on old-fashioned lines. Their fur stoles dangle the snouts and limbs of long dead foxes and their hats are as wide as their hips. It would be difficult at first glance to imagine what brings this unlikely company together. Business is over for the day at the House of Commons. It's 700 odd members, all men but one, have grappled with the fate of a military mission in Soviet Russia, the employment of ex-servicemen, how children should be provided with medical care at school and the parlour state of the house's ventilation system. Further afield, the country struggles to come to terms with the aftermath of war and the recent pandemic of Spanish flu. It's a cruel blow to an exhausted people only just beginning to raise heads above the parapet and look to the future. No family is untouched by grief. Some have reacted to personal loss by telling themselves that all that matters is to live for the day. Others disapprove of such hedonism, preferring to trust in the pre-war values that built the British Empire. Those gathering in Westminster that early spring evening in 1920 represent a third way. Between them, they are changing the way that British women live and work at home, in politics and in the workplace. Radiant with the partial success of recent crusades for the vote, university degrees and the right to a career, they have come to celebrate. Two veterans of the fight for the vote were amongst the first to arrive at the banquet. Ray Strachey on the left here and Millicent Fawcett, the leader of the suffragists. Both were progressive champions of women in the traditional professions. Not that there are many women in the traditional professions at this point. There's a few score doctors and surgeons, seasoned by war work, but unwelcome in most teaching hospitals. Some pretend engineers and architects whose unfeminine ambitions make right-minded people laugh. A handful of unorthodox priestesses, recalling Samuel Johnson's famous quip that a woman's preaching is like a dog standing on its hind legs. It's not done well, but you're surprised to see it done at all. There are thousands of women teachers, of course, but until the end of the Second World War, they are expected to resign upon marriage, which means that their average working life is just three years. A couple of fully fledged professors have been appointed, one at a Johnny Come Lately Modern University and the other at a medical school, and there are no qualified barristers or solicitors at all. Mrs. Fawcett is in her 73rd year. Most of the other women at the banquet are younger, including the bespectacled Helena Normanton on the left here, who will become one of the first two female barristers to take silk in England. Her almost exact contemporary Lady Rhonda in the middle, an extraordinarily energetic businesswoman and political activist from Wales, and a young wife and mother called Gwyneth Bebb Thompson. Officially, this event was to celebrate the passing of the Sex Disqualification Removal Act, or SDRA, a few weeks previously on the 23rd of December 1919 and to launch a loan fund for women students hoping to study law, now that the Act had made it possible for them to do so. But in many ways, it was all about Gwyneth. Gwyneth Bebb Thompson was one of seven children. She was educated at home in Wales and then at boarding school in London before going up to what was then called St Hugh's Hall, now St Hugh's College, in Oxford in 1908. There, she was one of the first women to study jurisprudence, or the theory and philosophy of law. Why did she choose what was almost exclusively a male discipline? 
It was a rash decision. Women were not permitted anywhere near the legal profession at the time, yet Gwyneth always intended to work for a living. And why Oxford, which refused to confer degrees on its female undergraduates until persuaded to do so by the SDRA? Had she been a man, Gwyneth's exam results would have pocketed her a first-class degree. More than that, she would have been the highest achiever of her year. As it was, she left university with nothing more tangible than a warm glow of achievement. Not particularly helpful when you're applying for posts alongside men with letters after their name. In 1913, Gwyneth sued the Law Society for refusing to admit women to train for the legal profession. She lost both the case and a subsequent appeal on the Alice in Wonderland grounds that, as women had never been admitted before, there was no precedent. And without a precedent, they couldn't be admitted. This was a common argument against allowing women into any of the six traditional professions at the time. Academia, architecture, the church, engineering, law and medicine. They called it the law of inveterate usage. During the First World War, Gwyneth married Thomas Weldon Thompson, a solicitor, and worked for the Ministry of Food before the birth of their first child, Alice Diana, on the very day the SDRA was passed in 1919. By now, she had changed her mind and wished to read for the bar. Her application to Lincoln's Inn was accepted the following day on Christmas Eve, and she looked forward with confidence to the future. Perhaps she was naive. Stodgy arguments against women in the professions had been circulating for years and were no less popular now than they had ever been, despite the passing of the Act. Gentlemen, for example, would never stoop to taking orders from ladies. It was degrading. It, it flew in the face of nature. Women were somehow unsexed by gentlemen's work. Old school doctors warned that thinking too much withered the womb. Some were refused high-caliber posts on the grounds of being too plain, others because they were distractingly pretty. And then there was the perennial claim that women couldn't possibly work in a man's world because nobody had thought to install any ladies' lavatories there. The smoking rooms of professional societies and associations in institutions and clubs rumbled with self-righteous discontent at the thought of a petticoat invasion while senior common rooms in the ancient universities refused to appoint women whose mercurial teaching methods might interfere with the proper education of young men. The SDRA did prompt action in some quarters. Not only were the inns of court minded to admit women. In October 1920, Oxford decided to award its female students degrees for the first time though Cambridge infamously resisted until 1948. Despite the act, however, this was in many ways the worst time for women like Gwyneth to think of entering the professions. Though they had won temporary respect and valuable experience by metaphorically donning pinstripes and, and bowler hats or overalls and grease guns during the First World War, Priority was now being given, quite rightly, to returning servicemen while their wives and daughters, sisters and mothers, were expected to unfold their pinnies and withdraw once again to the kitchen. It's a myth, therefore, that the First World War liberated women in the long term. Expediency meant that they were given the taste of independent careers, but socio-economic pressures ensured that in peacetime, the old order was reluctant to change. Lip service was paid in the form of the SDRA, but the professional world was still rigid in the years that followed, hidebound by convention, defensive, quite frankly, scared of competition. None of this daunted Gwyneth Bebb Thompson. As a young mother, still employed by the Ministry of Food, she dutifully ate her regulation dinners at Lincoln's Inn and passed the necessary exams by studying in the evenings during her first year. The future did indeed look bright, and she was already a dignified role model for the ambitious companions embarking on a working life in the professions. It wasn't easy. Barrister Helena Normanton was accused of willfully attracting attention to herself when journalists followed her every move and shadowed the progress of every hard-won brief this modern Porsche achieved. 
oh, how vulgar she is, commented her reactionary colleagues. How silly women like her are. Their brains are tiny compared to ours. Physically, they spend a quarter of their best years mired in Eve's curse. Mentally, they're all illogical. They're inherently biased. They're bitchy to one another. They're flirtatious with men, completely unreliable, sharing a peculiarly feminine trait, and I quote, of seeing through a stone wall what is not on the other side. And to top it all, they eat too much cheese at regulation dinners and don't leave enough for us. These are all genuine contemporary arguments against women lawyers, including the one about the cheese, which I still find quite difficult to credit. And they're transferable to women in all the professions. It must have been so hard on top of passing all the necessary exams and trying to find clients without appearing strident or pushy for these women pioneers to keep their cool when faced with playground prejudice like this. The title of my book comes from an argument wielded triumphantly by male architects to keep women out of their particular profession. It's OK, boys, they thought after a panicked meeting. Ladies can't climb ladders. Therefore, we as architects are safe. And if one or two do manage to work out what to do with their skirts and delicate ankles on all those rungs, they're bound to get terrified on the scaffolding and plunge messily to the ground, possibly displaying their underclothing as they do so. This cannot be allowed to happen. The popular image of the pioneering career woman is of a loud eccentric set apart from mere mortals by genius and grim determination, a sort of modern boudicca riding roughshod over convention to lead a growing army of formidable females to storm the citadels of the establishment and shatter the glass ceilings within. Most of my heroines in the book are nothing like that. They are you and me but more intrepid and with none of the advantages we enjoy because of what they did. I have to say, though, that Ida Mann here was in every way a woman apart. Her father encouraged her intelligence up to a point. He paid for achieving good marks, but withdrew her from school at the age of 16 as a matter of principle, consigning her instead to a commercial college where she was expected to work hard for a career in the post office savings bank. She did as she was told, you did in those days, and she got the job and hated it. One day she was invited to go and see the London Hospital after supporting a fundraising event. She was excited by the prospect. She'd always been keen on dolls as a child, not dressing them up in frilly frocks and having pretend tea parties, but plonking them down in disarray on makeshift beds and dosing them with potions and a sadistic glint in her eye. Not the best attitude for a doctor to her patients, perhaps, but that visit to the hospital convinced Ida that a career in medicine is what her life was all about. She made herself an appointment to see those in charge of admissions at the London School of Medicine for Women. It's a modern health centre now. And she got herself a place, passing the matriculation exam in the first division. She was ecstatic. And her parents, though surely dazed by her proactivity, did all they could to help her on her way. Ida devised herself a uniform for work. It consisted of a Norfolk jacket with lots and lots of pockets for various bits and bobs of medical equipment and spare bones and a stout skirt. She had her own skeleton, which was probably dug as most were at the time from the battlefields of the Laponionic Wars. Her teachers were exceedingly strong characters. One of them was Sir Amroth Wright, a notorious misogynist who appears as a sort of anti-hero in several of my books, actually. He was a virulent anti-suffragist and altogether terrifying, but Ida was unfazed. She dubbed Sir Amroth Wright Sir Almost Wright and was amused rather than offended that he managed never to speak directly to a female medical student ever. Sir Amroth, like the psychiatrist Sir Henry Maudsley, was one of those old school physicians who considered females physiologically and emotionally incapable of any meaningful political activity. Maudsley's famous argument was that women had a finite amount of life force in their bodies and if they sent it all north on thinking 
there would be none left for further south and reproduction. By the time Ida was studying medicine in the 1920s, however, no concessions were made to any supposed frailty. Ida went on to become a legend in her field of ophthalmology and the first female professor at Oxford. Do read about her courtship in the book, by the way, if you get a chance. I promise you a surprise when you hear what she and her future husband did to amuse themselves in private. And talking of romance, as the number and profile of women working in the professions began to grow during the 1920s and 1930s, so did the market for their newfound spending power. I've had huge fun researching the women's magazines of the interwar period. Appropriately situated love stories abound, hospital romances, for example. And there are lots of articles and advertisements targeted at the modern salary earning girl. And it's been equally entertaining to come across articles and advertisements about them. Here's a quick selection of some of my favourites. You can see that if you want to banish your grey hairs to make a good impression at work, you can use Vivatone Radioactive Hair Restorer. There's a lovely advertisement for Shell Petrol there. Of course, if women were earning salaries, they could probably afford cars. And there were ladies' models of cars being made at the time. And you'll see from this advertisement that a proper lady will choose Shell Petrol. Because if she doesn't, she'll look like the young woman on the right of the advertisement. And then I think this is my favourite cartoon of all time there in the corner, which is lots of gentlemen seated around a board table and one lady and the caption, that's a very good suggestion, Miss Trigg. Perhaps one of the gentlemen here would like to make it. Of course, each of the professions had its own professional journal. And one of the best, I think, is The Woman Engineer, which is still going strong. Published quarterly by the Women's Engineering Society from 1919 onwards, it's full of fascinating information and spirited, endlessly energetic, engaging personalities. Reading it is like peering through the window of a bustling workshop peopled by women who individually and together, metaphorically and physically, are constructing a new world. I wonder if you recognise this one. When we moved into our house here in Haddenham in Buckinghamshire, I was absolutely thrilled to discover that right across from us was the house of Amy Johnson. And this is Amy in an unfamiliar pose. She's usually far more glamorous than this. But she was first and foremost an aviation engineer and president of the Women's Engineering Society for some time. And here on the right is Margaret Partridge from Devon. She joined a firm of consulting engineers in 1917, specialising in heating and ventilation. She was initially employed, of course, to work in the office, but before long was out on the shop floor as a supervisor and tester at an electrical factory making X-ray machines and searchlights. She moved on to designing small electric engines, as you do, and she might have stayed in the factory had the gates not effectively been closed to women, like in the medical schools, when returning servicemen returned from the Great War to reclaim their jobs. The same did happen at medical schools, as I mentioned. The thing is that the medical schools stayed closed to women, most of them, for another 20 years. It wasn't until the Second World War that numbers started rising for medical students. Rather than retreat to the office, the classroom, or worse still, the front parlour, Margaret Partridge went home to Devon and advertised herself in the local papers as a country house lighting engineer. She offered consultations by appointment and by 1927 had won the distinction, somewhat niche, it's true, of being the first woman to wire an English village for electric light. Working with hard-won financial backers and eventually employing several members of staff and training female apprentices, Margaret brought electricity to entire villages across Devon and Suffolk. She built power plants, connecting houses and businesses to them so efficiently that anyone who had signed into the screen, to the scheme, I'm sorry, had merely to flick a switch and lo and behold, the electricity was on its way. Miraculously, it took only one hour to 
trickle, leap, fly, whatever it did, from the plant to people's homes. Before lighting their houses, Margaret illuminated the road outside. In Bampton, in Devon, when she first turned on the street lamps in 1926, that was always a very exciting, dramatic moment. Villages ran from their homes to gasp in astonishment. One man decided to spend his evening sitting underneath the lamppost, reading his newspaper. Once Margaret turned her attention inside, children were so terrified by the glare in their newly lit bedrooms that for several nights they screamed and refused to be left alone with the light on. Meetings were held to complain about this weird woman and her miles of cable until Margaret proved what amazing things she and her cables could do. As a woman in charge of her own enterprise, Margaret encountered plenty of male employees and clients in the course of her business. Naturally shy and well aware of the old argument that it was unseemly to uh, receive orders from a woman if you were a man, she quickly worked out that, and I quote, a judicious administration of praise and appealing to a man's pride in his job and capabilities will do far more towards getting the best out of anyone than all the vigilant strictness of the most powerful martinet. Salesmen jostling to supply components for her machinery were the worst to deal with, thinking that they could get the better of her, of course. As a rule, she said, a salesman is not fit to do business with till he has been properly squashed. One of the joys of researching this book was the discovery of an intricate network amongst these pioneers for mutual support. The Women's Engineering Society, for example, engaged eng uh, lawyer Helena Normanton as their legal advisor. And more than one woman doctor commissioned architect and stylish ladder climber Gertrude Levicus to design not only their hospitals, but their private houses. In 1915, when she was 17, Gertrude had been the first woman officially to enrol at the University of London's Bartlett School of Architecture. Her gender was not her only handicap. This was not a good time to have German parents. Gertrude had been born in Oldenburg, but had been brought up in South London. The recalcitrant father is a familiar figure in the history of ambitious women. He appears often unfairly as a sort of pantomime villain, virtually locking up his Cinderella daughter to while away that inconvenient period between being a schoolgirl and a bride. Mr Otto Levicus was different, however. It was he who persuaded Gertrude to become an architect. The luckiest thing that ever happened to her, according to Gertrude, was being taken on as a pupil in 1919 by Horace Field, who was a respected neoclassical architect working in London. You'll see that he signed her application for associate membership of the Royal Institute of British Architects, or REBA. It's a poor reproduction, this, for which I apologise, but if you look carefully, you can see where he and him have had to be crossed out and she and her have been put in instead. I understand that they didn't actually change the form until the 1970s. So women until then were still having to scratch out he and him. By now, Gertrude had a degree under her belt. She had experience in draftsmanship, gained through a holiday job, illustrating a book on classical design. And she had a genuine love of the career that her father had chosen for her. She designed what she called a few smallish country houses for friends and family. Lady Rhonda, who'd been at that dinner at Westminster, got Gertrude to make changes to her country house in Kent. After the Second World War, Gertrude worked on prefabricated homes for the East End and designed and built the majestic Finchley Road shopping parade in North London with retail units below and flats above. She refused to be pigeonholed as many early women architects were as a superior sort of amateur interior designer. After a long career and a long retirement, Gertrude moved in to a nursing home in Hove. To most of us, the phrase a nursing home in Hove conjures an image of quiet gentility with residents resting in high-backed floral armchairs reflecting on the past while waiting for lunch at noon. For Gertrude, it was no such thing. 
obviously proactive and busy all her life, it frustrated her to think that she was going to spend the rest of her days virtually doing nothing, even into her 80s. What could she do to allay the boredom? Well, what had she done all her life? She took paper, a pen and her drawing board and completed a detailed architectural plan of the building. It's beautiful and strangely moving. Once an architect, it appears always an architect. In fact, if there's anything my heroines in this book have in common, it must be their necessary refusal, like Gertrude's, to conform. It's a rebellion that most of them conducted with grace, high spirits and success. It's been a very joyful exercise writing this book. Eye-opening, certainly, and shocking many times, but overwhelmingly inspirational. I'm sorry that we haven't got time today to talk about some of the more astonishing women doctors and lawyers and architects and engineers, academics, even church women that I've come across. They are not celebrities. They're not even famous, most of them. They were just people of ambition, of vocation, who rolled up their sleeves despite all the obstacles in their way and got on with it. This, of course, is a history book. I'm a historian. But more than any other book I've written, it's also about live issues. These women were fighting for a balance of life and work that we have yet to define. They were fighting against the gender pay gap, lazy prejudice and stereotyping. When I asked a group of professional women recently whether they still felt like outsiders, the response was varied. Some had recently qualified, others were at the end of an illustrious career. Many considered themselves beneficiaries of a battle already won, while others were not so sure. It can still take courage for a woman to admit an ambition to join the professional elite. The senior partner in a high-profile firm of London solicitors confessed to me that she had to be pushed by a male colleague into applying for the position, feeling herself an imposter despite years of training and decades of experience. Women still have to be asked to dance, she told me, a little sadly. As the wife and mother of medics, I have endless, timeless tales to tell of discrimination. At an academic conference recently, I listened to first-hand accounts of underrepresentation and breathtaking gender bias. It can come too easily to us, I think, generically, to think of architects, engineers, even consultant surgeons as male. And senior women at the inns of court are still called master. I haven't even touched today on the marriage bar, which forbade married women from working away from home, although there's plenty about it in the book. But I'm sure you've heard or even experienced tales like mine when I was interviewed as a young woman for a job with a well-known firm of antiquarian booksellers and was asked to prove to the men on the other side of the desk that employing me would not be a waste of time and money given that I was likely to get pregnant. This talk of family potentially holding you back reminds me of Gwyneth Bebb Thompson, the lawyer we met at the beginning of this talk. Thanks to her engaging personality and an extraordinarily fantastic flair for her work that it was impossible to deny, You'll remember that Gwyneth was accepted by Lincoln's Inn to read for the bar as a married woman just hours after her first daughter was born. She was quite capable of being a working mother with the help of her husband. And that's what she was, a true pioneer, until taken into hospital during her second pregnancy in 1921. There were fears the baby might be premature and... She confessed to her sister that in the course of her work for the Ministry of Food, she'd been leaping about the country in the most awful heat and the baby didn't like it, apparently. Gwyneth suffered from placenta previa and hemorrhaged during labour. Baby Marion died two days after she was born and Gwyneth two months later. To those who thought her attempt to become a barrister ridiculous, and there were plenty of them, her fate was sad ironic even, but hardly surprising, and the waste of a damn good training. The rest of us can only admire her. She almost had it all.
Today, Gwyneth is celebrated as a heroine of Lincoln's Inn and a powerful role model. She's still inspiring her daughter's descendants, and so is her husband. Role models are desperately important to us as individuals because they challenge receive wisdom, and they show us how important it is to strive for things we might assume are beyond reach. Gradually, person by person, institution by institution, habits alter and expectations grow. Our reach extends as our grasp becomes stronger and more assured. The quest for equality is a long game and we're playing it still, but it's much easier to join in with things than to start them, to be a participant than a pioneer. To keep us going, we now have the proof of something the pioneers could never be quite sure of because they hadn't done it yet. Ladies can climb ladders as high as you like. Thank you.